Okay, hello and welcome guys to the Best of Three podcast. I'm Daniel Level, I'll be your host for this evening, and I'm joined by Tom and Vladis. How are you doing guys? Hello. Good, thanks. So today we're going to be talking to you guys about our top cards for the 2017 dual season. Uh, we're going to start with Magic Specter Unicorn Kieran. So guys, why was Kieran impactful this year? Well, at the start of the year, we were looking at metal foes, and like they can pendulum summon out high-level stuff, and as an untargetable beta that was bouncing stuff, it was really hard to deal with, particularly when Paleo was one of the biggest contenders at the time, and targeting was pretty essential for a lot of the trap cards that they were using. Yeah, so I agree that definitely Kieran was very effective at removing threats. Uh, it's also very important to note that it was able to be destroyed, and it has a search engine, which also could be destroyed, that really let Metal Pose kind of set up their board. Yeah. Um, the only problem with Kieran was um, it was quite, like, unhealthy for the game, in a way, um, as it was kind of just like a walking, talking floodgate that um, could, like, remove cards as well. Yeah, I agree with you there. It, it certainly forced deck building to put you in a position where you needed to make sure that you were playing things that could out a bouncing monster that would be untargetable and undestroyable. Yeah, and we definitely saw that with how um, DDD didn't see much impact on the format. Um, because if you set up Kieran, they couldn't really do anything. Um, yeah. So following Kieran, uh, we found that Zodiac, particularly Rapierre, Broadbull and Trident were all very impactful, so how did yeah. they kind of shape the format? Uh, well, as soon as Raging Tempest hit, we were just inundated with Zudex, and to no surprise really, like, we hadn't seen anything like that. Just having one material Xyz monsters that you can stack up, you get advantage, and you have interaction from your opponent's turn, it was super consistent, and there was no way that anything else, at least initially, was going to be able to stand up to that. Yeah, it was a weird thing with Sue, because um, it was probably one of the most, like, unique, um, like, decks we've ever had, um, like, in the game's history ever. Because um, it, it kind of, like, um, it kind of made sense how, like, the cards worked, but, um, like, unfortunately, like, the idea, like, the concept they made for Zoo ended up being, like, way too powerful, because uh, it just gave you way too much free advantage. So it kind of just, like, just completely dominated the rest of the decks. And like it's it's either you just play zoo in your deck or you just not like you know you you play in a, a a very rogue strategy like what yeah, that. yeah. Uh, and at that uh, point if you're just playing play. zoo in your deck it was most efficient to just play pure zoo uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> until people played paleo and then apparently you know paleo is quite good too yeah no I was actually a big fan of the zoo format that we had at first uh, before people realized that. Um, the lunar light fusion yeah. sub combo uh and you could just go first and draw three cards or more if your opponent didn't have a hand trap to interrupt you there was no losing that game it was absolutely ridiculous so i think that kind of ruined the zoo format for me yeah and the zoo format we saw two other cards introduced that really produced massive amounts of value in that grass looks screener and masterpiece to true draco's layer that was Maximum Crisis. That was later on. Right, yeah. So Raging yeah. Tempest, we had that grass, that grass like screener. screener. Yeah, it was just grass, yeah. And that was another one that really warped the format. We ended up in a position where lots of decks were playing 60 cards just because they didn't want to lose to the blowout that you could suffer if your opponent resolved grass. It went so far as I knew people for YCS Prague that were playing 60 card lists not because they wanted to play grass or even they weren't playing it just because it was such a blowout that you could lose the game instantly yeah and then the other kind of like um the thing with grass was um a lot of the grass decks tended to kind of just be inconsistent um so like you would have just like a pile of you know whatever 60 cards but like 57 of them would not be grass um three of them would be grass but uh like it was the problem with um like it, it, what would happen is like with the grass decks is um like infernoid in particular that deck did not do much uh, at all without grass um but if it like thanks to the zoo stuff that came out you could probably you could just go like you could do your full zoo combo 
and then you could basically just play the Infernoids as like a side engine to go like barrage summon your like full zoo board with the confusion of combo, and then you just end with like normal summoning like Decatron or something, uh, just to get like an extra negate. Um, but like otherwise, the, um, the problem with like those decks was um, especially like the Life Sworn and like those decks, um, like uh, excluding Paleo because Paleo was like such a completely different deck, um, like after Prag, but. Um, the, the Lightsworn deck, like the, I know a lot of people in Europe are playing um like the Lightsworn 60 card list. Um, I know of a bunch of the Germans um and Alpes group are playing uh and like a bunch of Italians were playing like Lightsworn. Uh like like Lightsworn Zero or whatever. And uh, that deck was like really, really like inconsistent, but like the power level deck was like insanely strong. But it was just like it kind of just traded a weird like variance to the format where oh I drew grass, I guess I win. Um Was it at this point that there was little development to the Lights One deck because at the time Minerva was still scarce, and so it was yeah. limited to people that had access to the prize card. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, we definitely saw a lot of impact from Grass during the year. Um, so following that, we had Maximum Crisis. There was yeah, and this is where we did team. see Masterpiece. <laughs> yes, and here we saw Masterpiece. So before we talk about anything else in Maximum Crisis. Would you like to talk to us about Masterpiece, Tom? Ah, uh, Masterpiece <laughs> was an absolutely ridiculous card. Uh, in much the same way that Kieran had done before, and to a far greater extent, it absolutely shaped the meta in that you simply couldn't play a deck that didn't have outs to Masterpiece. And you had to be aware of all of the potential configurations of Masterpiece. So it was essentially you had to be able to summon something that was bigger than it, reliably yeah. or you needed to be playing kaijus in abundance yeah and even the true draco deck in, deck in general because it had the utility of its trap cards that definitely also did a lot of shaping of the format like if masterpiece yes. alone was released it wouldn't have had the impact that it did when it could be summoned and destroyed two cards on the field just on its summon yeah. Um, so while Masterpiece was released, we also saw the release of Zodiac Chakanine. So that gave the Zoo list a lot more strength. So Vladis, you played quite a bit of Zoo, didn't you? Yeah, uh, I played um, a bunch of Zoo this entire uh, year, unfortunately. But um, it, it was like it, it was fine. But like the problem with the Maximum Crisis for, uh, Crisis format was um there was a bunch of like small type of like if you want to call them paradoxes in the format so uh maximum crisis gave birth to like a, a few different like archetypes uh like uh, archetypes of decks so yeah like pure draco you had you know pure zoo and then you had like the new like variants which would be the true king zoo variant but then more importantly the tr true draco zoo variant um so the true draco zoo uh deck was basically uh, a cool like very big like combination of everything that was wrong in that format um so you'd be summoning free dudes with like you know a free pop every turn with like broadbull and dryden and again uh search very consistent and at this time we still had the fusion sub combo and thanks to chat it basically turned any zodiac into the fusion sub combo whereas just the tiny format <clears throat> where like that was at two it was so it was a little bit like clunkier to do the sub combo um but in the Maximum Crisis format, with thanks to Chakanine, doing a fusion sub combo was like so much easier. So um, it was it was just like a, like an extension of how unhealthy that combo was. You just draw a bunch of cards, um, and then with two Draco Zoo, you'd also be summoning a masterpiece on top of that, which is just like <laughs> so like just uninteractive. Um, but like despite like all of this, somehow pure zoo was still like somehow the best deck just because it was so versatile it was like it didn't play too many engine cards and there's just so much room for you to play like 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 quotation marks like tech cards to like I mean, yeah it was around deck. this time that we were exploring things like uh enemy controllers and pianissimo yeah. just to get an edge in the zoo mirror match because the yeah, cards exactly. themselves could carry it i mean i think yeah. zoo kind of leads us on to our next card which is ash ash blossom and joyous spring and it really yeah. sums up the year, in from my point of view, in that this was the year that you put as many hand traps as you could into your deck. And we see that the best decks throughout this year, from Raging Tempest onwards, were the decks that you had slots that you could put interaction into. 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. And now Ash Blossom was uh, a really <laughs> weird one in that at first people weren't even playing it simply because there was so much searching in Zoo that shutting down one didn't yeah. matter. Yeah, it didn't which kill is... anything, so it, it was just an egg one. It's a crazy thing to think because I don't see any format coming up where you wouldn't want to play Ash Blossom at the most number of cost P's that you could, you're allowed in a deck. But there was a time that we didn't simply because it wasn't enough. Yeah, but the, the problem with that then is like it creates a little like tiny paradox like window where you can actually play 60 card decks thanks to no one playing Ash Blossom. Um, yeah. So it was yeah. kind of like a weird like... Um, uh, a weird problem in the format. So unfortunately, masterpiece had already done for the viability of Paleozoic. So, <laughs> so leading on from Maximum Crisis, we saw Master Rule Four reach the TCG, which came with the Link Strike starter deck, which is arguably one of the best starters we've seen in a very long time. And in that, we saw a standout card in Decode Talker, and to a lesser extent, Link Spider. So, what were you guys' thoughts on how Decode Talker has affected the format? Decode Talker has been absolutely mad. I think it has been one of the absolute standout cards since Master Rule 4. It's enabled so many decks to continue to be played. Uh, the likes of ABC absolutely wouldn't exist without Decode Talker. And it's just such an easy thing with uh, Gofu at the time being at 3 you can throw out a decode talker and have access to extra monster zones without even using up your normal summon for the turn. Yeah. It's it's quite weird too, because um I haven't seen a single person put like decode talker on like, you know, they're like, you know, one of their best cards of like twenty seventeen. Like decode talker is like super underrated. Like if, if you look at like the list like after decode talkers, like uh the release or whatever, and after zoo format. Um, that's like another important thing. Um, like nearly every single deck played Deco Talker just because it's just like it has it can be a solid body. It has like a a, a very like nice cherry on top, like a, like negating targeting effect, but also just like the genericness of it just made it like such an like outstanding card. Um, yeah, I even mean, the attack boost as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, it, it is the biggest feature of the format, right? Uh, yeah, sure. It, it's it, it's effectively. Um, having played a lot of Spiral recently, there are a lot of cases where just having a big deco talker kind of lets you push through for game. Um, so after Link Strike, we saw the release of Code of the Duelist, which was our first main set pack for Brains. Um, and Code, we had two standout cards. So the first card was Firewall Dragon, which I know, Vlad, as you have had lots oh, of uh, interest. I had so much fun with that card, but... Um, so, with Firewall Dragon, um, unfortunately, right, even though it is, like, you know, uh, they made it as a main character, like, uh, card, right? Like, you know, like, Dark Magician, like, Neos and whatever. This is, like, the first time where they've made, like, a absolutely, like, absurd card for, like, a main character. Like, as far as I remember. Are you suggesting uh, this is better than number 39, Utopia? I mean, one in doubt, Utopia <laughs> out. I can't argue with that, but, um... With, with Firewall Dragon, it kind of like led to a bunch of unhealthy like combo, uh, in 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 more in more like um a more of a broader sense FTK ish decks. Um, so when Firewall came out, um, decks that would abuse it would be a Dino FTK deck. Um, this deck uh, topped YCS Rimney, I believe. Um, it was like it was, it was one of the weirder things like no one really talks about. Uh, but like Firewall Dragon, even coming into the future for 2018, I think this card will be like super, super like not good for the game at some point where it'll, it will have to just get hit like it has in the OCG. I think it's been put to one or whatever. What do you guys um, I feel like Firewall has one of the most unhealthy card designs. Uh, yeah. It's just ridiculous. There are so many opportunities to put once per turn on a card and none of them got taken. Uh, we've seen... Grand Soil taking a hit for Firewall Sins. Uh, arguably, Digesto Emerald needed to go anyway, but I doubt it would have done if it weren't for the abuse it was seeing with Firewall Dragon. Now, it's it's so ridiculous that even if you just put this card could only be returned to the extra deck once per turn, you'd still just shut down the loops. But the fact that nowhere on that card is there a hard once per turn clause is absolutely ridiculous to me. 
would you guys agree that Firewall and Decode kind of represent Decode shows what we want to see from Link cards, whereas Firewall shows kind of a direction that is perhaps a bit too extreme? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, okay, we're going to try and get through a little bit faster for the last few cards. Um, so the other card of note in Code of Duelist was Trickstar Reincarnation. Um, would either of you guys like to talk about why um, that card? So, the, like a weird thing with Trickstar Reincarnation is it was um, released in Code of Duelist where nothing from that set really like made an impact, but like the Trickstar stuff made a huge impact after Zoo was gone. Um, mm -hmm. I think, uh, personally, I think the Trickstar attacks deck is like super unhealthy for the game. Um, but mainly because of like the uh, interaction that Reincarnation has with Droll Lockbird. Um, because like I, do, I don't think hand-looping your opponent is particularly fun in any way. Um, like I've played against so much Dark Synchro that I'd rather play against Dark Synchro than get Droll uh, Reincarnation like like almost every yeah, game. But there is like uh, a, a bit of counterplay to it where you like, you know, you set your cards first, but um, it's still like but then their field the spell effect. interacts with you setting yeah, cards first, so exactly. it's a very interesting deck to play against. And reincarnation yeah. is the fact that it can hand lock that it's a problem card, yeah. more than the fact that it banishes a hand. The banishing of yeah, the is really interesting with the deck that we're about to talk about. Because if you guys are okay, we're going to move on to circuit break, and circuit break, of course, probably the most prominent card from it is spiral double helix, Ooh, which. Boy led us to enter the current spiral format so who would like to talk about double helix uh yeah i'll chat a little about double helix uh spiral sort of came from nowhere it was the deck that you'd see played on the bottom tables at locals by the kid that liked spies you and then bam answer, double like helix came out of nowhere and started summoning master plan for free along with Master Rule 4, allowing people to use Master Plan for Link Summons to get it off the field absolutely every time reliably and just accrue obscene advantage. The, the double helix and the deck at full power with all of the level 1s and machine duplication was completely ridiculous. Uh, the, the combos that people were pulling off without even investing any resources from their hand, very reminiscent of uh, Zodiac yeah. Uh, yeah. in the unhealthy times when we had fusion sub combo when people would go first, they would build a board and it wouldn't even matter if you could out that board because it didn't cost them anything to do and so they've still got a full hand of resources to beat you down with after you've invested everything getting over what they did to start Yeah, and the deck even had the extra extension in things like Big Red for the second turn, so even when you cleared their board, even though they had a full hand, it was actually a stronger hand, because they could recur a double helix, and they start at link two instead of a link one, going into their yeah. second turn. Um, so, alongside that, we also saw the release of Evenly Matched and Warlord Dragon in that set. Um, so, Vladis, would you like to talk about their impacts? Yeah, so, um, Evenly, and, uh, I'll, I'll talk about Evenly first. Evenly was kind of a weird one for me. Um, like, at the start, um, we had, like, kind of easy answers to the, the card. Um, because, like, it didn't, like, impact the first Spiral deck, like, too much. Because you could just end with, um, the Trap Card Engrave Mission Rescue. And they'll just be able to just like pop whatever they have with the agent anyway. So like evenly watch wasn't even that good. And at that time, some people were still playing set rotation. So it made the card like uh, have a bit a bit of a weird um, like drawback to it, where it's like uh, it has like a bit of variance where if they draw the set rotation and you draw the evenly match, you're you're just like straightly at neg one. And then if you have any field spells in your hand, you're at like even further disadvantage, which is just like not nice at all. Yeah. Um, but even like even then. I think evenly mash is just like all like pretty much like one of the worst card designs I've ever seen in my life. Um, it's like it's like even more unhealthy than like Exiton Knight. Like the card literally just like punishes you for playing the game. Um, like this card is like I think just way too good against Pendulum decks. But um, I think even in the like future, we can probably just tr there there'll probably be like even more outs to evenly mash. I think there'll be like people starting to play tax just to like be evenly matched. Um, 
well, like I mean, other, we, other than we've seen it at Prague Part yeah. 2, in which people were uh, maining and siding Mindcrush in the Spiral Yeah, Mirrors exactly. To and uh, Sound Scalding too. Um, um, so then Borlai Dragon also had a lot of impact in the Spiral Mirrors. Um, yeah. We saw that Borlai basically outed everything, except for another Borlai. Um, yeah. And especially as we saw the decks moving away from Utility Wire, we saw Borlai sticking on the board a lot longer. Um, so we have two last cards to talk about. We'll talk very quickly about them. So Tom, would you like to talk to us about Destrudo? Oh, I love Destrudo. Uh, he's been a, a big boy in uh, an ABC and Invoke deck that I've been playing at every event I can get to recently. Uh, I find the deck really fun. Uh, I think Destrudo has been a big part of the game primarily because of Ancient Fairy Dragon and the power level that we've seen in field spells recently. Like Spiral Resort is a truly obnoxious card uh, just when they tacked on that none of your spiral cards can be targeted part. Yeah, it when it was released it wasn't effect. a problem but now that we've got very strong spiral engine in double helix it is. Uh, so I think yeah through access to Ancient Fairy Dragon and the prominence and continued release of very strong field spells make it an excellent choice given that you can get into Ancient Fairy with any normal summonable non-tuner and a distrudo yeah and then vladis would you like to talk to us about number 41 baguska the terribly tired tapir uh wh where can i start about babushka um <laughs> so this card you know just like evenly before not very nice for the game um it creates a strategy where it's just like um i'm gonna end with this on my board you won't be able to do anything unless you're also playing a link deck uh by circuit break is your nearest card shop um and then you were just like, oh, your opponent passes, and then you switch your Baguska to attack mode, then you switch everything else to attack mode, and then you kill your opponent. Which kind of like, um, was, wasn't like a very, you know, a good thing to have in the game. Uh, but it also just promoted, like, just told everyone, hey, uh, look at these new blue cards with arrows on them. Please buy them, because Baguska couldn't touch any of those cards. So, um, yeah, that was, that was fun. It's almost as if it was basically just like a big uh, product placement. Baguska is a very interesting card. Like, yeah. it, it definitely is very oppressive, but um, it, it definitely creates interesting board sticks. Uh, sure. it, it interesting, but also not fun to play through sometimes. But Sometimes. I, I mean, we see decks that are very focused on monsters at the moment. If we were yeah. in a format where Double Dark Hole Raigeki were still a thing and were played then Baguska might be less impactful than it currently is. Or, or decks that yeah. just like, could spam out link monsters without having to use field effects. Yeah, I the, the sad part about Baguska is that a lot of times it'll get summoned, and there's maybe a 20% chance that your opponent just can't play anything, because yeah. it's a, an extra deck floodgate that you always have access to, and a lot of the time, if you're playing a deck that can make it, and you have a bad hand, you make Baguska, and there's a little coin flip going on that you might just win the game off the back of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, very quickly, Tom, what was your best card in 2017? Uh, well, obviously, Theseus is the best card of 2017, um, but aside from Theseus, yeah, I, I think, think Theseus that... Theseus is the best monster of 2017, okay. I believe that's true. Okay. So... <laughs> My mistake. Uh... I think it has to be the low-key pick on Decode Talker. Not necessarily the strongest, but the most important card for certainly the latter half of 2017. Sure. Uh, Vladis, top card of 2017? Uh, I think uh, Grass was probably uh, my pick. Um, I played Grass a lot. Um, the card's like really cool. Uh, I might, it's a bit unhealthy for the game because it creates like a bit of generous strategies, but it also kind of breathe it like new fresh like life into the game where it's like oh by the way you can play 60 cards and actually have an advantage instead of just playing 60 cards because uh, you just wanted to play a bunch of cards in your deck because you like the look of them um yeah, so, yeah for sure grass is my pick uh and then finally i'm going to say <laughs> ash blossom enjoys spring as i mentioned earlier this was definitely the year for hand traps and it looks like we're going to see that following through into 2018 so ash blossom is definitely going to have a big impact Okay, well, guys, that was the Best of Tree podcast. Thank you, Tom and Vlad. Thank you. And Thank you.